I hit a thousand subs. So I took a short hiatus over the end of last year and the start of this year to try and focus in on my thesis and hopefully finish it. I got extended, it's, it's, it's fine. In between this break and me coming back in the last few months, I actually passed 1,000 subs. Uh, mostly thanks to Thought Slam featuring me in the eyeball zone. I just woke up one morning and I'd passed 1,000 subs and that was really cool because I like them numbers round. <laughs> so my pal Tash Reynolds did a 1K subscriber Q&A drunk and I thought it was hilarious. Uh, so I thought I'd do a similar thing. Um, I've been imbibing substances, officer, uh, and I've got some beer as well. And we're just, we're going to have like a really chill time. And if this is, if this is unwatchable swill, I'm going to make this Patreon only. <laughs> okay, so uh, I was just scrolling to Curious Cat. I've scrolled way down, so I couldn't see any of the new questions because I wanted to be surprised by them. Uh, and right away, I see this question. Why Hardcore Lime? What does it mean? Um, so Hardcore Lime is actually an anagram of my real name, Michael Rhoda. Uh, and I like anagrams. <laughs> Anagrams like make my brain tingle like them the, just watching the letters go around in real time and like forming a different word like it activates It's just cool, man um, So Hakka Lime is an anagram of that um, I liked that it was like two nonsense words and like maybe it would stick in your head except I Get asked the question a lot. What does Hakka Lime mean? <laughs> and I got a Pretend I put more thought into it than an anagram machine. Other anagrams of my name, by the way, include Mr. Crime Hero Lad, Emerald Choir, Older Chimera, just some really good stuff. Uh, all of which could have, they could, they should have, maybe, maybe they should have been the, the channel name. Makes more sense. One Kit Wonder, who knows me in real life, asked me, who do I love more? Out of my two cats, Covey and Google. A cruel question asked by a cruel person. But I'm going to take it as an opportunity to grab the cats and show you, show you my cats. <laughs> there he is. So, I'm holding him badly. So this is Google. See how to... It's you. It's you. This is Google. He usually likes being held. I must be annoying him. Um, he's my girlfriend's cat. Uh, he's the biggest baby on the planet. Um, he, he's, a, he's 10 and he's just like an old sweetheart. I love him very much. Kitty. And, oh, Kirby, no. Kirby's flighty. And this... Is Kobe. Kobe is my uh, Kobe's my cat. He's three. He's a little hellhound. <laughs> he uh, just eats. He chews on things and he eats things he shouldn't. And he wrestles. And I love him to bits. He's perfect. He's never done anything wrong. Uh, as per your question of who do I love more, neither you monster. <laughs> Stay off my channel. <laughs> Beautiful drink. Okay. Uh, Ron Rugged, aka Ron the Rugged Midwesterner, who in my head I sometimes think of as Ron the Ronad Mid Ronina. Um, sub to Ron, uh, asked, What is your stance on punching neo Nazis? Pro, anti, or is there a little bit of nuance? Um, I think. Okay, okay, I'll, here's some nuance, alright. And a neo-Nazi is actively holding like a newborn baby and, and he doesn't have a good grip on it. And that thing is, is 85% of the way out. And the only way he, he could, that this terrible man, the only way that this terrible man could save the innocent life would be to focus all of his attention on catching that baby. If that horrible neo-Nazi is doing that, then you shouldn't punch, you shouldn't punch that person in that scenario. Um, the second that baby's down, yeah, punch that guy. Fuck that, man. P pro. Uh, Anonymous asks, what is Australia? 
<laughs> well, like, okay, that's that's like a shit post question, but it's making me think about like I'm too high for this. Because, like, what is like Australia's a crime is the first thing that comes to mind. It was stolen from you know the indigenous Australians, which that's like the first crime. But then there's like a thousand crimes on top of that. Most most of them again on the indigenous population, all the way through to like genuine war crimes, real actual war war crimes at wars. That yeah, we, to Australia, I don't know. Like I, it's like. We talk about, like, the nation of criminals because it's, like, convicts who are sent over here, which is, a, like, another crime, by the way, as it was pretty messed up. Um, but, like, we're, yeah, it's a, it's a nation of criminals because of the... Crime. Just it's compounding... Compounding levels of fucking crimes against humanity, man. But, no, it's, like, it's the meme. The meme country. This is funny memes, you know? It's, like, it's a... Oh, there's a little shark. There's a sh- Bring my Vegemite shake. What do you think you'll do with your life in a post-revolutionary society? That's a nice thought. <laughs> that is a nice... That's a nice thought. Because you you just think of the struggle. You don't think of the after. That, that's a nice... I think I could be happy so long as I was... able to write in, like... Even if not a professional capacity, just in a fun capacity, like having time, like that isn't soul crushing, alienated labor, having time away from that to like make videos, or like write my weird unpublishable fiction. Um, but you know, like in a post revolutionary society, my videos would all be about like, like why Sean Marion should have been in the Basketball Hall of Fame by now. Or like, yeah, it would be about that sort of, it would be about stupid things. It'd be, I'd be ranking, like, flannels from Kmart versus fucking Target, which wouldn't exist. It's fine. No, we'll repurpose their names. <laughs> Kmart is now a revolutionary bookstore. <laughs> uh, so what is your creative process for videos? Um, I do, I, okay, so most of my videos start out as what my therapist would call hyperfixation. Um, and I just get, I just, I just get like obsessed with one thing. Uh, and, and normally it's like a, a thing of politics or a thing around sport or whatever. And like, and so then I'll like read more about it against my own opinion, find out what my like educated opinion is. And then I will rant about it to my girlfriend in the morning while she gets ready for work. Um, and if, if I've gotten to the point where she's already been like, dude, stop talking about Kevin Rudd <laughs> or like stop talking about product placement in a Spider-Man movie, then I know I need to get out of my system with a video. Uh, and so I spend heaps of time in the, the library no, I don't. Why would I? I was. I gotta stop doxing myself. I like libraries. They have books. Books are good. Um, sometimes digital, you'll get like articles. Whole new world out there, man. Uh, yeah, I research a lot. I shoot bad footage. <laughs> I t- <laughs> don't worry though. I got a green screen now, so it's gonna fucking take off, mate. And uh, yeah, then I. I beg people to watch them and many of my nice friends <laughs> voice went high many of my nice friends uh, dig that Ooh, best and worst things about being a YouTuber the, the term YouTuber implies a certain level I think of doing it professionally <laughs> you know what I mean like I would never go up to someone and be like I'm a YouTuber no I keep that press down <laughs> um, but as far as best and worst things of whatever it is, I do. I'm realizing I'm being rude to the question asker. You're just using, like, common lingo. You didn't mean to start that. You're a good person, probably. And I forgive you for that thing you said to your loved loved ones. 
Best and worst things about me and YouTube. Best is I've met like very cool people. Everyone always says that. They fucking they always say that. But it is true that like once you if you find a community of like minded people who care enough to like put a lot of work into the stuff and you know, there's it's cool. It's really nice. Like I think I've made hopefully genuinely like real friendships with people or even just sort of knowing someone tangentially. It's, just, it's nice. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I know that guy. <laughs> I know, I know, um, Paul Morin. <laughs> Shout out to Paul. His videos are amazing. I've been, I've been watching, um, a lot of them lately. Was that best? Yeah, it was best. Worst, uh, lots of Nazis. A lot of them. Uh, just, they were all over the place. So I, one of the videos that I did... So one of my videos was on the Jordan and Michaela Peterson diet, the beef thing. Because again, I got obsessed with like just the storylines of that thing. There were just so many implied bits. It was, it was just dominated my mind for a while. And I, yeah, I made this video. Um, so I, that's the only thing I've made where I've had to turn the comments off. Um, because me and my, my girlfriend, I, I released it. Then we went on a vacation to Europe, which we've been like saving up and talking about forever. Uh, and so I released it. And at first, the only people who saw it were like, you know, like-minded people who fucking eat a t- tomato once at least. And then the pro old beef diet people slash Jordan Peterson defenders found it. And they found it while I was overseas. So I would just be like with her at like, you know, an amazing museum about whatever. Or like, you know, this natural beauty. And I just get a comment. I'd be like, oh my God, can you believe this guy? He's been on the all beef diet for three months. He's like, what, what, what is he talking about? He's, he can't be shitting. This, this is the way he's not, how is he shitting? And, you know, um, that wasn't a fun way to spend, like, my first time in Europe and, like, my first time seeing snow. Um, so, and, like, it actually kind of got to me, too, because it was, like, a lot of comments were, like, you know, you're wrong. Um, you know, I'm going to try this. I'm going to be on it for a, a year and I'll come back then. I'll tell you about it. And I just, I don't know, all I could think was, like, that these poor people had been conned into, like, this last grasp diet that is a placebo, but a placebo that, like, will kill you. And I just, I didn't, it made me sad, so I turned off the comments. Every now and then an angry person will comment on another video from that, and that's, like, that's really funny because it's not concentrated. (laughs) Um, But, yeah, people, they, I just, they kept being, like, tell me they were going to die for fucking Michaela Peterson. So the sad parts are the bad people. The good parts are the good people and the sad parts are the sad people. The bad, sad people, not sad, very angry. Uh, which piece of media would you say is the first one or one of the first that made you realize the depth art can have? That's another awesome question. Um, uh, it, was, it was a book by Mark Haddon, I believe, Mark Haddon, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. It's like a detective story uh, through the eyes of a, I think, 14 or 15-year-old kid with Asperger's. Um, For me, at that age, it was done this way that blew my mind about, like, I, I was just, like, the kind of thought that was in there and about how well the book sort of put you in his mind and made you feel what he was feeling and ah yeah I was 13 and I read that and I read that because my mum was like oh you remember your old friend the, this guy I was like yeah and then this friend and she, um, I was like yeah and she said you should read this book it is about the thing that the condition he has and I didn't know what a condition was I think and I just sort of knew him as that kid from school who was sometimes be mean for some reason <laughs> Because I was like, I was very little then, and I was, I was, I was, I was, I was I wasn't smart, I wasn't woke, I wasn't, wasn't woke. Um, and so I read this book as a, yeah, as a, as a 12, 13 year old, I think it was in year seven. 
uh, and 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 by doing that, I gained this much deeper understanding of this kid who I I didn't I never I never got, and it destroyed me. So let's let's all think about me. So yeah, <laughs> I don't know how good the book I don't know how good the book holds up. I think it's it's pretty famous, so you can probably find out. What is your least favorite anime? <laughs> They're all. I mean. There are so many, you know, the, oh, it's a bad, it's a bad medium. Is it, what's the show, Kill the Kill? I think it's Kill the Kill, I'm searching now. Yeah, Kill, I, I watched the first episode of Kill the Kill and I was, I thought it was really cool until the last fight when they, the, the, the hero got powers it has a big sword and it cut off 90% of her clothes and it was just, it, it, oh yeah, there's, uh, fan services I find very boring. That's, that's the worst one. All of Pokemon is better than that. Objectively. I'm a lower energy than I thought I would be for this. You know, I'm at Jeb Bush and, and I thought I was going to be like, Can't think of a high energy politician who's not a fascist. Upsetting. Byron Clark, one of uh, top five New Zealanders. I'm saying it. Top five real or imagined. Byron Clark. Uh, great, great chow. Follow him. He asked uh, one of the old classics. If you could replace the cast of any movie with the Muppets and keep one human actor, which movie do you choose and which actor do you keep? Uh, and so I would choose Steven Spielberg's Lincoln because uh, it's like a very dreary, serious movie and like it's got that grey monotone sort of filter and I think that would be very funny on Muppets because they're not that serious. They're clowns. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking about Muppets. Uh, and, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis, he would just go in there and just knock it out of the park, man. He's a pro. Uh, you don't need to tell him about not talking to the Muppet operator. He's, he's method. He would never do it. Oh, I'd crush that role again. Have not seen the film, by the way. <laughs> I'll sit through three hours. And... Have you considered streaming any time? Uh, like, a, I, I, so I don't, I haven't streamed. I don't, I don't. I'm not a, uh, um, so I've, I'm not a big video game player is, is one of my things. I'm not, I'm not a huge, I'm a fake gamer. Uh, there is, I'm a fake gamer, you know? Um, so yeah, um, um, I don't really, I've never streamed games. So I don't, I don't, really, I don't, I don't care that much. Not to disparage the people who do, uh, you know, like they, their gamers are great. If I, if, if I wish I was a gamer so I could make a thoughtful essay on why a game and society, um, <laughs> okay, I'll pitch some gaming videos. GTA Five and the, uh, the cult of consumerism. You'd you'd click you'd click. On, I'd click on that. I find video games interesting. I just I'm not I'm not much of a player. I'm not very good. Red Dead Redemption and the histor Red Dead Redemption and the politicization of history. 20 minutes right there fucking Labor Kyle you can have that mate the only thoughts I've ever had I, w I once joked about doing the crossword <laughs> oh fuck I sound so old oh no we do become our fathers ah <laughs> I thought about doing the crossword but on an app it's, it's a New York Times crossword app modern <laughs> Um, I thought about doing that and like streaming it so that way when I get a question I can't answer, I, I'd, I'd ask the I'd ask the chat. Um, that was more of a joke than anything. And the only other idea I had this is a really stupid one. So naturally, I think it's pretty funny. The only idea I had was to film me reading to stream to stream me reading newspaper opinions until I can't anymore and make that like a daily or a weekly thing of just trying to get through 
the not even the worst opinion columns, just like I don't know the the Sunday the week the weekend Australians or the Sunday Mails, and it's just like, how long can I do it to myself while yelling about it? Tune in for ten minutes of content every week, but I don't know that'd be funny. I thought. Uh, otherwise, <coughs> yeah, I don't know. Hit, hit me up. Uh, so Anonymous asked, what are you getting drunk on? Uh, and where I will bring you to attention of the beer. Uh, Cuba's Pale Ale. It's like a local South Australian. I say local, but like it's, it's, it's a big company. It's not like two dudes. And it's like, it's the standard beer here. It's just, it's, just, it's, it's the one that your dad, you drank. I'm mentioning dads a lot. Too, too much to reveal. People can destroy me with that information. Why is my neck so low? Oh yes, yeah, so I'm just drinking uh, Cooper, Cooper's Pale Ale, which is like the standard South Australian beer. It's the one that like my brain associates with beer. I just imagine it. I, I, I taste it. Probably compare all other beers to it. Uh, they are not paying me. I'm just a fucking shill. Um, shout out to the stubby holder guys at the Bunta Vista Socialist Club. They make an excellent podcast you should support, but they should just be focusing on the fucking stubbies. How good is that? They are not paying me either. What are your five favorite books? I'll get props. These are a few that I generally just say are my favorite whenever that question pops up and just other ones. Um, Virginia Woolf, Mrs. Dalloway. Um, I, I, she had probably a couple of works that were more ambitious, pushed the bar further that I would, I would, I would say a you know, better writing and maybe I would like them more on a different day. But this book is just one of incredible insight and empathy uh, into the human uh, condition. Ugh, pretentious. And for a work from 1925, yeah, it was, it was, it was particularly incredible. Um, it's third-person interior narration, so, it, so, it, so it's a third-person voice, the authors, that can go into these minds and like explain what they're feeling why they're feeling and it took that to a to a really like just a, a degree further than anyone else had done to that point and you get the book through two main characters back and forth back and forth and then there's this one scene where the main character mrs dalloway walks through a park uh and suddenly instead of being just on her for the chapter it bounces between five or six different characters and for a paragraph you get just these really beautiful views into these people uh, and just in such a beautiful and concise and good way before anyone had really thought of doing such a thing um, she was just a real genuine genius um, I believe we would say that we stand uh, next up my probably my favourite book on balance of all time like it's the one I come back to most Kurt Vonnegut's Cat's Cradle. So if I was being honest, I would have at least three Kurt Vonnegut books in my top five, but I thought, you know, limit it, limit it to one. Don't bore the people. But don't bore the people more. Uh, Cat's Cradle is like this... It's it's clever satire, but even removed from that, from like this layer of irony you might go from it, it's funny. Like the the, the dialogue and the voice is just funny. It, it's, it's a really funny book, but it's very serious and it's very smart science fiction on top of that and it and it you know it talks about religion and and belief and the end of the world and it's so good i just yeah uh cat's cradle kurt vonnegut um slaughterhouse five breakfast of champions oh what's that russia mother knight uh so sirens of titan if you're into sci-fi sirens of titan is the book Kurt Kurt he can do it and next up a visit from the goon squad GS for my goon squad Jennifer Egan uh, sort of similar to Wolf 
she's incredible at going into different minds and uh, inhabiting a voice and a character and sort of endowing them with these common beliefs that we all have, but phrased in a way that you would never think about it. And then these really interesting things that, you know, about this character that you can just grasp because she's so clear and eloquent. Uh, this one, it's very, they're either very related short stories or loosely separated, loosely related chapters in a novel. Critic. Yeah. Um, about music and New York owns. I haven't read any of her other stuff yet. That's, I'm really meaning to, though. Uh, this is for um, Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, this, is, um, uh, this is the best book cover of all time. <laughs> it's kind of... Next up, um, I don't have my actual favorite book by this author, which is one of my, again, all-time favorites. Uh, but this is The Invention of Solitude by Paul Auster, which is a really stunning part memoir, part fictor, criticism, experimental and cool as hell book that he wrote. But my favorite work of his is The New York Trilogy, uh, which is three novellas of postmodernist detective fiction, a phrase that I love and that most most people don't love uh, <laughs> but it's a incredible book incredible incredible use of the detective the private detective as a genre and warping it until it's almost unrecognizable um, author self insert stuff that's not obnoxious it, yeah you I know um meta fiction metal language that's sure smart cool fucking awesome stuff mate uh then last up and this is kind of the weirder book I guess that I recommend is uh Mar- Marilyn Robinson's Gilead uh it is it's a it's a book about a Christian a uh, Christian reverend in 1956. Uh, he knows he's dying, but he actually has a young son, and he's writing all these letters to his son. Um, sort of a, I'm not here, but this is, this is what life is. Young snapper. Um, and the reason I love this book, I, I, I was raised in the church, but, you know, it's not, it's not my big whatever. Um, but this is a really empathetic loving understanding christianity uh and it's 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 honestly it's 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 really beautiful it's just the writing the writing i think is really eloquent i think i want to fucking peel it or something yeah i want to, I want to peel it or whatever i want to, mm-hmm. but there's just stuff in it i really enjoy like a good sermon is one side of a passionate conversation it has to be heard in that way there are three parties to it of course but so there are even to the most private thought, the self that yields the thought, the self that acknowledges and in some way responds to the thought, and the Lord. That is a remarkable thing to consider. I, I, I don't know. I don't believe it, but I just, it's, it's, uh, I, 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 I think it's great. And it, it has, it does have a wonderful story that it really does get into, sort of about his past, how he came to faith, yada yada. Just a bang. I almost lost, I thought I lost the fucking thing. I was losing my buzz, so I, I took a, no, that, that makes it seem sus. I took a, I took, I took a shot, and, um, never drink, never drink to excess, kids. <coughs> I've got asthma too, which is no fun. Try walking around needing to suppress a cough all day in these times. <laughs> Truly, truly, it is me who has suffered the most from. Those are my five favorite books. At the time, they'll still change. Okay, can you explain what a PhD in creative writing is? Slash, tell us what yours is about. 
<clears throat> this could be a family. This could be a family member asking. They ask this. Um, so basically, as far as our program goes, you write either a novel or a collection of short stories or poems, or whatever your form is. You write a long work in that. Uh, and then you write uh, what's called an exegesis, which typically is an essay around the work, the, you know, talking about the work. You're, you, that's the academic part. It has to be, that's, it's up to standards. Uh, and so my work is sort of this, uh, it's, it's a book, it's a novel, a novel, it's a fiction book. It's a story about some 20 somethings from Australia. Um, so one of them's an artist and, uh, he gets the idea to start the museum of climate change and climate criminals working title. Uh, and it's like, it's like a, he starts this art project that's essentially, you know, just trying to put a human face on climate change and be like, these are the people who got us and, you know, they're the, uh, and it sort of catches on in artsy circles and it's the story of them and them like going to America, uh, and come back to Australia and like sort of, you know, countries. Um, and yeah, it's sort of about the environment, uh, about like what caring about the environment does to your brain on some level. <laughs> like it's about burnout and, uh, fear. It's unpublishable. <laughs> no, it's no, like look for my Indiegogo in 2021. Cause this is, mm. um, but it's, 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 yeah, I don't know. It's kind of about how hard to impossible. Some would say, satire is now like political satire and just just the fucking awful state of it and partially about how we talk about climate change how capitalism is to fault capitalism is of fault the fault perhaps um uh yeah and what art can or can't do um so the video i put up a little while ago, uh, the political history of climate change is <laughs> that title. Um, that was part of my exegesis, which is my academic portion, and I was essentially saying like it was like sort of a creative example of what content that museum would make. Like, like it's a fictional, hardcore lime character in that world making that. Uh, and now you're part of the fic. You part of the fiction because you commented. And that means you're not real. I made you. <laughs> I I have a lot of fun. I have a lot of fun doing it, though. It's really good. Do you think Julia Gillard is overrated? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, like... This is, it's funny, because I think she's, she's overrated in liberal... In, like, pseudo-progressive Australian movements... And Bush, obviously, she's not overrated with the, like, fucking One Nation voters who, like, are still obsessed with her today. <laughs> um, I think those guys are overrated. <laughs> They're no fun. <laughs> do, you, <laughs> do you ever think about dicks? Do, yeah, I, I know some people. <laughs> uh, what do you consider the foundational texts for creative writing and literature criticism? Such a such a wild swing, such a wild swing from dicks <laughs> to this. I feel like I'm talking slow, and I'm gonna. I feel like I'm talking slow. Comment if you think I'm talking slow. If you're one of the 12 people who's watched here. What do you consider foundational texts for creative writing and literature criticism? Or criticism of any work? And this is by... From Inaki. Who is uh, on Twitch. And you should probably watch them. I don't know. 
they were very nice to reply. Thank, thank you. So, uh, so I didn't, um, I don't have a lot of theory books. I just got from the library because, yeah, library. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find the two, like, creative writing things that I always recommend to people. Um, I think I've lent them out and lost them along the way. Uh, so for creative writing, as in the actual practice, in terms of, like, writing for joy or profit, one of the, like, holy bibles is Strunk, uh, William Strunk, and, uh, someone with a less memorable name, (laughs) Uh, wrote the elements of style and it's a really uh it's a it's just a good little book that it really gives you an example of what the average well, not the average it gives you an example of what like good writing is uh you will learn just like little things that you might know intuitively just in how to phrase sentences where where certain things should be stressed and where things shouldn't uh, and the good thing about this is, like, if you want to have any fun at all, knowing the traditional is the best way to, like, you know, play with that and play in that space and just destroy it if you want. Um, another, the other one, this is one I actually recommend. This is, I, I fucking, I think I've, I just lent this thing, like, hey, save all my writers group. I just, I would lend this whenever we had someone who wants to, like, write fiction, I always hand them a copy of Stephen King's On Writing. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't have a copy anymore because someone found it. They had more use. And if they got joy from it, that's my bike. <laughs> uh, yeah, Stephen King, On Writing. It sort of uses Stephen King's gift for non-pretentious, clear information. Uh, and it's, it's quite personable, especially. So the first half is a autobiography, which is actually pretty interesting. If you, again, if you're interested in writing, read it, whatever, it's 120 pages. Uh, the second half is then his sort of way of uh, describing the trade, uh, the trade or the, the art form. Writery do. As far as literature criticism, there, there are a bunch. Uh, Virginia Woolf, uh, funnily enough, earlier mentioned her early essays, you know, most of her essays, but her essays on literary criticism are spectacular, um, as you'd imagine, uh, for someone who's so important in the modernist movement. Uh, inc- just, again, incredible understanding of the interiority of life. Uh, early, early feminist history stuff too. A Room of One's Own. Check that shit out. You will... You, Hey, you and me, between you and me. Also, um, Northrop Fry is a really good foundational piece, especially, um, what was his fucking anatomy, anatomy of, uh, anatomy of criticism. Northrop Fry's anatomy of criticism, um, is, is a good, it's, uh, it's very, wide ranging but not dense so if you want to look up two or three things specifically it yeah it's good um another one of the big you know harold bloom gets brought up a lot i think he died last year um yeah canon is i I, i'm both fascinated by and repulsed by the canon oh i hated that no i don't like that guy he's in he's that's (laughs) You're gonna get a bit. <laughs> but no, the the idea of the Western canon and pushing that is is, is quite interesting. Um, I just don't think it took into account sort of the regressive nature of that and about what is considered canon is uh, so typified by the mainstream, which is kind of the point. But it, it also missed it, 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 like it is the point, but it, it also means that that's not challenged, and it should be. It should be, Harry. 
Thank you. Thank you for your service. <laughs> uh, other people. Judith Butler always will come up. Same thing with um. So a lot of post-colonial study study post-colonialism. It's very important. Um, oh, other yeah, I fucking grabbed these like a minute ago. Um, cool books also for theory of uh, criticism literature. Um, Maggie Atwood. Oh, don't call her that. You don't know her. Margaret Atwood did on writers and writing. Yeah, cool shadow. Uh, which is sort of a collection of a. Uh, lectures gone into essays um and it's a little more verbose it, and you know it's a it's more literary than king where king's work is an instructional guide this is closer to philosophy you know um you do it is written very much in like a pleasant lecture would be from a you know Genuine fucking luminary. Uh, Borges. Jose Louis Borges. Not a name for the Australian accent. Awful speaking. Uh, he did on writing as well. Uh, I think, I think you gotta, like, that's the dream is to be thought of well enough to be able to use the title on writing without being a wanker. If I did on writing, if I made a video called on writing tomorrow, you would be allowed to kick and punch me. Uh, anyway, Borges, the fucking man. Uh, Labyrinths, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful work. Uh, but he's, no, he, he talks about how critics criticize. I, I haven't come through all of this. Let's be, f- oh, someone's got weekend plans. This guy, I miss... I miss sports a great deal. He talks about contemporaries. He has a little section on Virginia Woolf, on T.S. Eliot, Faulkner. Ah, oh, fuck, I love Faulkner. Ah, oh, should they do some Faulkner? No. Um, and it has a little piece of his criticism. Believe it or not, it's very good. And Yeah, just uh, fuck, fuck with Borges. Uh, and then finally, I haven't read this yet. And I really want to. Uh, it's Roland Barthes Mythologies. Bart is the effing man. Oh, that's another one. Um, where did my perfect recall go? Linda Hutchin. There it is. <laughs> I could have searched a whole manner of things to find that one. Linda Hutchin, uh, University of Toronto, the best, I think, writer on postmodernism. Um, many, the found, the best foundational is the, especially, I think is the key thing here. Uh, just incredible stuff, sort of documenting the movement as it was happening and writing about it so clearly and smartly. I'm not reading anything. At all, I I have, um, I'm going to fucking screenshot my screen and show you half the window for questions and, um, half the window, uh, for uh, cricket stats. I was staring at some of the cricket stats and I got distracted. (laughs) How, I, are you, how are you still watching this? I'm probably editing this together very mad at myself. Linda Hutchin, a uh, really awesome, awesome thinker. Talked about the politics and poetics. These are were her two two of her major works: the politics and poetics of postmodernism. Uh, she wrote very insightfully on postmodernism. She wrote uh, she wrote very insightfully on postmodernism as it was emerging. Uh, and became, yeah, this foundational, this thought leader in the field. And it's very funny to me that she's a tenure professor at the University of Toronto, Jordan Peterson's old haunt. And I just imagine, like, her at some point being at a staff meeting with him and him being like, oh, the, the, the postmodern Marxists are... And um, her having to hear those words and... Mm, 
than like wanting to go back in time and not be. But another important postmodern thinker, perhaps even the most, Roland Barth, oh, it's upside down. His work on signs and signifiers rules. Yeah, it rules. It's really good. Um, I haven't read mythologies yet. And it's, it's supposed to be, like, uh, more stuff on... I th- I'm pretty more stuff on semiology. I don't know. I, I really enjoy his stuff. I talked about him... Oh, shit! I talked about him in um, my very first ever video that you, dear watcher, might not have seen. Uh, I made... So my first video was on J.K. Rowling and the death of the author. Fuck it, I'm gonna tell this story. I like this story. I don't need your cues to give A's. So get ready for like the A. Yeah, I'm gonna tell the story in my first video because it's my my channel and I can do what I want. So I fucked up my back a couple of years ago. Uh, bulging disc? Yeah, bulging disc, sciatica, some nerve bad. And it knocked me on my ass. Uh, I was I had to sort of lie down. I was yeah I was basically bedridden for about a month. Like I, I after the first few days I could walk around okay, but I couldn't sit down. I just had to be in bed for as much of the day as possible. And we got a TV in there. And while I was heavily depressed, I got obsessed with the Bon Appetit Test Kitchen, sorted food, philosophy tube, and H Bomber Guy. Because a mate of mine had recommended me H Bomber Guy, saying like, "Yeah, oh, yeah, he makes these funny videos, and he hates people that you hate." And this friend of mine had been recommending him for a while, but he's like my friend, who sometimes has very good taste, and sometimes just is obsessed with a weird book from the sixties, and we all have to deal with that. But this one stuck, um, and I watched H Bomber Guy, and I was like, "Holy fuck, this is so funny, this is so good." Blah blah blah. Uh, moved. I got. Recommended the other one, Philosophy to you. <laughs> Very famous man. Uh, and I was like, oh my God, yeah, this is great. Um, and this was, I guess, a year and a half ago. Almost two years now. Yeah, so I binged as much of that stuff as I could do. And it sort of planted the seed of like, that looks fun. Like, I really, I like, I like talking about, Theories, I like talking about art, and I like talking about politics sometimes. And so, I don't know, I started thinking of different ideas that are based around, like, literary stuff and politics and, like, trying to get them to intermingle in interesting ways. And the first one I could think of wasn't really that political, but it was it was the thing I was, like, it was the thing I was obsessed with at the time. Um, and it was J.K. Rowling and the death of the author, um, because I was just, I'd always been so interested in little add-ons she made canon and what was and what wasn't accepted by fans and what where the line was. And so, yeah, it wasn't really that political a video. Uh, and I, I, I had a great time making it. And it was, I, I, oh, no, I, I missed over the important part. I, I, so, I, yeah, I started watching more of these people and I found the BreadTube subreddit. I found more creators that I really liked. Um, like Lindsay Ellis, who I used to watch when she was the nostalgia-related one. Sarah Zed, who's awesome, uh, and just you know other, other other people you've heard of who are wonderful, and I was like, oh, it's so cool, and they'd all mentioned Patreon, and I thought, yeah, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna I'm gonna pony up and I'm gonna sign up for some Patreons, and the first person I supported on there was Sarah Zed, um, but then I, I opened up the Patreon app when I was going home <clears throat> to try and connect the Discord or whatever. And it hit me with this thing, which was like, announcement from Sarah Z, next video. And it was like, I saw the words JK Rowling and author. And I went, holy fucking shit. Because <laughs> um, yeah, Sarah Z, big YouTube good. Me, still forming brain. I have got to go to sleep. This is, um, this is the last, I think this is actually the last question anyway. So I was like, Oh no, if 
Sarah Z does this and then I do it, I'll look like a, a, a goddamn phony. I'll be I'll be the laughing man stock. No one will ever take me seriously. I think at that point I'd actually written a draft script. Yeah, I had. I'd gotten really into the idea. We had a camera and I was like, you know what, let's just let's just try. And I'd written a draft script and had in like, you know, all the stuff I was gonna do. And I read that. I'm like, oh shit, I gotta do this now. And so I did it over the weekend and I just recorded my voice over like all the Harry Potter trailers stitched together, basically. And then every now and again, shoving in a slide from Microsoft Excel and this footage of Roland Bart um, from an interview he did. For some, and I found out some French channel. And I was like, that's, that's the guy that I'm th- making theory come alive. You know, look at this guy. What did I do? Right, yeah, so I stitched it all together on DaVinci Resolve. A uh, program I still use, and I I watched tutorials like as I was stitching these clips together with my voiceover, which I barely treated at all. I don't think I I yeah I think I just recorded it right next to the computer. And over forty eight hours, I recorded it, edited it, and released it. And you could tell. <laughs> um, I, and yeah. Anyway, people were quite nice about it. I think on part partly because luckily it was like like you know there were some cool ideas in there. And partly because I'd made it very obvious it was my first video. Uh, and people are nice. Then, anyway, Sarah Z did release uh, a video, of course. It was really good, and it didn't touch on any of the same things really at all. Um, and so it was very funny. So I, cause I got, like, spurned into action because I'm like, oh, geez, if this big does the thing, well, I won't be able to talk about the dang thing. But in reality, I, d- I did the dang thing. A uh, small amount of people saw it. Then she did the thing, and that actually sent heaps of viewers from that to my thing. So you know, I don't know. There's a f- maybe there's a fable in there. They make Harry Potter content, I guess. Uh, anyway, um, I kept doing things, uh, and then eventually, I got a, a, a email being like. We got a copyright claim in your Harry Potter video. It's blocked in all territories. And I went, no, this damned Warner Brothers. These two brothers coming together to stop me. Just because I used five of their trailers back to back as background images while I talked about their shitty author. <laughs> Yeah, and so I clicked through, but no, it turned out the copyright thing was from the weird French intellectual channel that I took the couple minutes of Roland Bart smoking footage. So, so it wasn't the big company crushing the little man. It was the small intellectual institution enforcing, I don't know, man, it was weird. I just do, I do like to think of someone in heaven or hell, someone trying to explain to bots what YouTube is and how I used his image and got it video taken down because I think it would uh, hurt his brain. Um, but yeah, no, that video is it's it's blocked. And I sort of thought about re-uploading it with the, f- the footage changed. But then I'm like, I don't know, it's probably really bad. But I'm like, maybe it's allowed to be bad. Maybe you just have, you know, you have a bad thing, it's fine. But then another part is like, you could take the bad thing and make it, you know, better. You you, you, you make it dang good. Um, And that's uh, where my brain is right now. I, and I don't know. I feel like, I mean, I, I, I guess I'd, have better audio quality. My audio used to be worse than this, can you believe? If you watch to hear, you are clearly a good person who cares about my content. So tell me in the comments or on Twitter or whatever if um, I should remake that completely, partially, or not at all. It's, like I said, I think 
not a good video with some probably helpful yeah, with some ideas on literature I don't know you f you <clears throat> yeah that'll probably do me um a huge thank you to everyone every single this is a thank you to this is a thank you to all people <laughs> As always, thank you to my patrons. Um, they allowed me to buy a crappy green screen uh, that I'm probably going to do my next video with. And uh, that'll be a, that's a learning experience. It'll be a learning experience. I'm looking, really, I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be fun. Uh, and I'm hoping to get some sound absorbing foam too. Maybe a curtain for that window. It's... it's just reflect it's a sound reflecting factory in here but thanks to my wonderful patrons it will not be as bad special, special thank you goes to uh kitchens who is the newest um very good person <laughs> is the newest member of my whoa ten dollars are you sure tier of patron guys uh Thank you so much. Kitchens. Kitchens. Thank you to these patrons too. Wow. Uh, yeah. Thank you for watching. My energy levels have absolutely crushed. Um, <laughs> Peace, peace out. Oh, I'm on Twitter at, uh, I, I am on Twitter at Hardcore Lime. Come harass me there. Bye.